I'm Caitlin Cadju, an animator and illustrator. And I'm Ira Marks. I write and draw comics. And this is a podcast about the mysterious and magical process of bringing cartoon stories to life. In today's episode, we've got our bus tickets. We're getting on the cab bus. And we're riding off to adventure in the forest. We're going back to our childhood. We're experiencing uh, Hayao Miyazaki in Studio Ghibli's My Neighbor Totoro. Aww. Welcome to Cartoon Feelings. Uh, okay, Kayla, and I've got a question for you. Yes, now you may speak. So the show is called Cartoon Feelings, are correct? You, are you sure? Yeah, it is. So does that mean our our guests are cartoon feelers? I hate that question, <laughs> and I will not answer it. Did it seem like I spent a little too long <laughs> typing that? How long have you up? been thinking it? Yeah. I thought it up really quickly, but the presentation was awful. No, Ira, all of our guests are human beings. All of our guests like Mark Crilly? Uh, I mean, I assume so. Mark, are you there? <laughs> I am indeed. Am I saying your last name right? I'm going to ask that every episode. Oh, you are. You are. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm so excited to talk about one of my very favorite movies. Ooh, I think this is a, a top tier for all of us. I mean, like, oh, yeah. if it's not, if this movie, listen, audience, if this movie is not in your top listen tier. Listen here, audience. <laughs> I, I think that's just impossible. This is just a timeless classic on all levels. It's like saying you don't like the hungry caterpillar or something. It is like that. This is foundational. <laughs> I was telling Ira before we recorded that I was re watching this with my husband the other night and he'd never seen it before. <gasps> and I was like, yeah, bizarre. And um, I was like, wow, this I feel like this movie explains a lot about me. And he was like, oh, yeah, this is your rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, amazing that you could pick that up so fast <laughs> from your first viewing. All right. So Mar Mark Crilly, uh, professional cartoonist, graphic novelist. Audience, if you don't know who Mark Crilly is, if you've ever learned to draw an anime eye or hand or limb, <laughs> odds are Mark Crilly taught you on YouTube. I think maybe that's... Oh, wow. That, do you think that's pe most people's reference for you or like what's your point of view on yourself? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, there's Explain so many yourself. different, you know, I've gone through so many different phases of my career, but uh, for sure, a lot of people know me by way of these YouTube videos. And you're quite right. Most of them, uh, at least in the early days, were focused on drawing in a manga style. Yes. And of course, you also have like 40 some odd books. I mean, just extremely prolific, I would say, like mind-boggling oh, prolific. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. no, I've been very lucky, and um, just the other day, my editor said, uh, boy, it's, you really don't do the same book twice, do you? <laughs> Which is wow. maybe not such a good thing for my career. <laughs> Nobody knows, what is it that you do, man? You keep changing so radically from one book to the next. But yeah, that's just my instinct, I guess. Good God, you just kind of opened the door to a conversation that could just be a podcast where Kayla and I are always <laughs> discussing, like, kind of like style and... Yeah. What it means to open another door into an aesthetic and what yeah, that career, does to the... what a creative career is. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, well, I think we can come back around to that, but maybe we're, yeah. we're going to keep plugging away. So if that comes up naturally again. Yeah, we'll work at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe, Mark, maybe you could kind of say where My Neighbor Totoro fits in your life and why you picked it. Because to me, as someone who's been reading your books uh, forever since I was like a young teen, uh, oh, wow. I've been into your work like this movie makes a lot of sense in terms of a choice you've made. So maybe tell I'll, us why. Yeah, well, you know, I'm one of these lucky people that's old enough to remember when it first came out. And I wasn't living in Japan at the time I was in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, I remember seeing on VHS, it couldn't have been too long after it had come out, uh, the part of it, on, you know, at someone's home. And I think I was lucky enough that it was the classic uh, waiting for the bus scene. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah I and I remember thinking, wow, this is really interesting. But I, I just, at that time, I wasn't fully tuned in to the importance of what it was I was seeing. And then, uh, of course, as the years went by, I finally saw the real thing. 
uh, from start to finish. And, you know, I loved it the first time and I loved it even more the second and third time. And I've probably seen it at least seven or eight times uh, uh, all together. Do you, we, Caitlin, you and I, I, I can't remember if it's the last episode. This comes up every once in a while. Like the question of what might it have been like when something comes out, like, uh, yeah. you know, do you, so you don't remember, because I, I think my the little reading I was doing, this movie wasn't like a massive hit until they started airing it. Yeah, I think on, uh, on what, or it's almost like you saw the products mm. before you even saw the movie. I mean, I feel like it sort of uh, the toys and everything, you know, I think it started to hit on that level, along with it being probably like a perennial fam family favorite on TV in Japan and Taiwan and, and, and other places. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I read that same thing that, and I was surprised that it wasn't like a smash hit uh, in the box office when it first came out. Well, this was something that was totally new to me, but this was when it screened originally, it was a double feature with Grave of the Fireflies. Which just yeah. seems very wow. advanced to me. That like... Yeah. I don't know if I could handle that. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if everyone listening to this has seen that other movie, but it is <laughs> so sad and yeah, it's, I, it is so heavy. And, I, I, will say, uh, I haven't actually seen it because oh, I am really? so Gosh. afraid of being hurt <laughs> that I have not. Yeah. So I just don't know if I could. The emotional whiplash of watching that <laughs> before or after My Neighbor Totoro, I that might just cause me to crumble into right, dust. Right, right <laughs> into the fan. Yeah. Great of the Fireflies ends. the The fanfare of My Neighbor Totoro begins, and like, hey, let's go! As they're like marching through the and story, and you're weeping openly. Thank God, right? Okay, so, man, I need to meet the person who did experience that because that is a true individual. Or they're all dead. You can't survive that experience. <laughs> Okay, so that that was kind of the first fun fact. And I think, it, yeah, I mean, I don't know what it says about the time and place of that. Or, you know, the studio was very new. These two films are kind of marked the second and third features. It's only the second one Miyazaki had directed because Nausicaa, which actually Nausicaa is not technically Ghibli, right? Yeah, it's. Um, oh, ding, dang it. It's that other one. I always like I don't know the whole history of it, but I had the sense that Miyazaki yeah. Miyazaki himself had a whole slew of earlier projects going way back and things that look a little low budget to us nowadays. Uh but I was a little surprised by what you just said that this was only the third uh movie the official uh Ghibli uh movie. Yeah, because it's uh, Castle in the Sky and then this double feature. And then that's technically like the, the foundation of the studio. So I, I guess Miyazaki, the pairing was that they had, I mean, maybe they had, cons well, he had, like you said, he had, he, this idea had been kind of floating around. It sort of was posed as, I think, as a children's book way back in the day for him. Um, but because it doesn't really have a plot, I think that was their hesitation to release it separately so they're like all right we'll pair it with the the saddest movie mankind has ever known <laughs> oh and it's so funny because it almost feels like a mickey mouse cartoon like oh yeah like let's just open it, it but it's like a whole movie instead of just a like a five minute little short yeah <laughs> totally and you can almost see this story being condensed in that way right you could like make it about one yeah. little girl and a kind of alice in wonderland when i had seen journey. somewhere probably on the Wikipedia page, if I'm being honest, and I don't quite recall, but that they had started out with like, oh, it's going to be an hour long. And then it just became longer, mm -hmm. which I think is funny because you almost, yeah, you feel like it could go either way. Yeah. But I love the idea that they were like, there's more to unpack here. We got to <laughs> spend more time with the cat buzz. Good God. And they're right. No, they are right. I mean, like, uh, I mean, this movie doesn't feel long. It just feels like it has beautiful space in it, right? This is another vibe movie. Ira, I would say. Um, Mark, Mark, where do you sit on vibe movies? I like to define, to give it well, a, to define you know, it's, I'm hesitant to say that this movie has no plot because I think people kind of get the wrong idea from that. And it almost sounds as if we are saying, you know, the person who wrote this movie neglected to do their job in terms of providing a plot. Whereas I think 
far from it. This is a very deliberate choice. And the the absence of the sort of cliche traditional plot that we're all used to, I think that's the superpower of this movie. Because mm -hmm. if you, you get rid of all that junk of like there being a bad guy and there being a climactic sequence and there's going to be a, a shocking twist and all, you get rid of all that, then you got the space for all this beautiful other stuff that doesn't normally get into a movie. I love that. And I think that's true. And I feel the same way about like Kiki's delivery service. Cause people say yeah. the same thing about that movie. And I'm like, it does have a plot. It's just, it's a lot of it is like internal. Nobody's mm -hmm. like fighting a bad guy. It's just like, I'm struggling with like my own personal situation. And, uh, I don't know. I appreciate that in its own way. Yeah. It's like th these type of stories that kind of fit in, boy, what Mark, you know, like, just my brain, uh, just because of it's a professional necessity. Like I think of how things fit in marketplaces. Like this is such a a young reader story, and to me, like like you're saying, the plot, like it really is just sort of like the awakening awakening of like a perspective on the world, and that's all it needs to really be because that's a great message for a young viewer, um, right? Because it's like about both girls sort of seeing the their new environment as it is and what it could be and how they fit in and what it means to be part of community, like all these kind of fundamental social elements and like family elements. And then it's you, once you check all those boxes, like you've, you've got a great children's story. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking it reminded me a little bit of the classic uh, Winnie the Pooh books, mm -hmm. that those are not stories that are ticking all these boxes of having a bad guy. And, you know, they're gentle, quiet stories, but, these are enduring classic stories. And I think he was reaching back to that type of thing. And I think, you know, if you just start to imagine the Americanized version of what Totoro would be, you just start, <laughs> it makes your <laughs> flesh crawl. Because, <laughs> right, there would be the bad guy. Oh, there's that old man on the hill who never liked Totoro. You know, you could just imagine the really cheap, awful version of this movie. Right. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, it's totally true. And it just, uh, you know, like we, Caitlin and I, when we do the show, we really uh, just chaotically bounce back and forth between like Eastern and Western storytelling. <laughs> and it um, it really does kind of rattle your brain how distinct um, what what production like demands to, to make a bottom line or what makes a blockbuster or how many jokes they need per minute that happens in, right. in some of these films. And some of them can be great. Like last week we... Uh, last episode, we did The Emperor's New Groove, oh, which okay. growing up, that movie just felt like because uh, I, I was too old to hit it at the right time. It felt like a lot of jokes. It felt like it was working really hard. But revisiting it now, like I totally see a place and a purpose for it. And I think this one, honestly, I think I did when I first saw it, I did expect more, even though the cat bus scene has always been the my favoritist thing I've ever seen ever. But I do remember being like, I wish there was a little more to the plot. Now I can appreciate it, it, but um, it was a little hard, uh, the first viewing. I'll say. Yeah, I wonder if you um, read the same thing that I read that that cat bus scene was kind of the beginning of his inspiration for the movie. That he that rather than a plot, that he had this image in his mind, almost this pictorial image, of the girl with the umbrella standing at the bus stop next to this big mysterious creature and that he sort of expanded the story out from that sort of to you know to, to make that scene possible uh, so it is sort of interesting that that remains the scene that really sticks with us all mm. uh, if if it's true that that was the first thing that had popped into his brain yeah I believe it was like the first piece of art that he'd done for it or something mm -hmm. and was like I would like to offer a baby's perspective on this as yeah. I was born in 1990. So after this movie actually came out, uh, but I saw this movie. I, for the longest time, thought this was just one of those weird, like hidden gem movies that <laughs> like only I knew about for mm, a long right. time because my experience with it. And I'll be, I have told this story multiple times on this podcast, but I'm doing it again because um, it's very relevant this time. Um, but I'm fairly certain this was one of those movies that I used to rent from the video store over and over and over and over again. And I was like, 
five or six probably Mm -hmm. and i think my mom told them to lose the tape because she was getting (laughs) tired of it because i do have a distinct memory of being in a blockbuster and they were like you know like we just don't have it we Mm -hmm. just so somebody (laughs) and i'm pretty sure she told them to tell them to tell me that probably because there's a lot of kids yelling in this movie and i'm sure she was Mm. tired of that um but (laughs) I loved it. And like watching it now, I just, I feel like I revert back to that in a way. Like mm. I, I, it really does inform so much about how I was as a kid. So watching it now, I'm like, oh my God, of course. This was like everything I wanted to see as a child. And I, as a Wonderful. kid, was like, where's the cool stuff? Like, where's the cool shit? Where's the fantasy stuff? Where's mm. like the monster in the forest? Like, where are my little sit sprite guys? I was, I was like that for maybe too long growing up, <laughs> like <laughs> hoping that you would stumble across something like very magical. And I think I just wanted to like live inside this world. And mm. like, as a child, it was just like, this is where I want to be. And even now I find it so bizarrely relaxing, just like looking at the background art and listening to the music of this movie. It just feels so magical to me in a way that is probably in a large part childhood nostalgia. But it's just like there are kids like this is what kids are like. I don't want to say every kid is like this, but it really this is like the most the movie I've ever seen that I'm like, this is what I was like as a child. Like, right. That's us. Like, that's childhood. And I that just feels really special. And it doesn't need to be more than that. Even though yeah, there no, is, it, re- you know, a- it really does tap mm-hmm. into childhood in a way that most of these other movies can't because they don't give themselves the time to do those scenes. Like there's that whole sequence where May, uh, the younger sister, finds this rusted bucket and she's searching around and she's like get- putting flowers on her father's desk and saying, oh, you're running the flower shop, daddy. And it's like it's taking the time to show you childhood, real childhood. And uh, I think because so many movies are like, no, we got to justify this sequence. There's, we got to build to this next twist. There's no time for it. So uh, I think really, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a high wire act because it does, when you make a movie that appears a little slow like this, it's, there is the risk of it actually being slow mm-hmm. and, and boring the viewers. But uh, Miyazaki knew what he was doing and he pulled it off. I, I'm with Caitlin in that um, even though I was a lot older than when I when I first saw it, I did feel like this was like a secret gem because like you're saying the tone. And now that I'm trying to like dig into it a little further, you do see some of and I think this speaks to its staying power is it does seem to have it, what I think are like some Western influences within it. Like it does seem to want to play to like a Disney fan in it in its ways and there's a lot of just evoking like mark you were saying the bucket scene when may looks through the rotten bucket that's such an alice in wonderland moment yeah. you can kind of feel it as a kid even though maybe you haven't studied plot structure you're like now we're going down the rabbit hole like basically right because yeah, she starts yeah. like following who is it uh the, the, yeah, chibi, the tiny little baby one chibi totoro is that they all have names i, I don't saw. know their names i didn't know that oh well let's get my that favorite out the one the little white one <laughs> okay so there's Ki- king totoro or like totoro oh who's the big guy then there's chu totoro who's the little the medium the, sized um yep and he's got his little acorn sack and he's great and then there's chibi totoro who's like the, the little <laughs> littlest cutie he's like a little chicken he has little like chicken feet yeah he's got a little chicken legs and for i love some reason. him <laughs> god they're all so great it's just impossible not to sound really annoying talking about the details of this i'm just like eh, it's a little tiny so little things. baby boy <laughs> Now, I, wa- I wanted to ask how much of a connection to Japan the two of you have, uh, because there, you know, so much of this movie is relating to traditional Japanese culture. And I do sometimes wonder if everyone in America who's watching it is has the context for a lot of this stuff. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely no context, no, personally either, speaking. So. And like... <laughs> I think as a child, maybe that made it more magical in a way. There are all of these like clearly spiritual places and moments, but we have no frame of reference for it. And I'm like, I'm a baby. So I'm like, that (laughs) statue is really neat and like have no idea. Um, But even still to this day, I don't really, I don't really know a lot about the specifics. No, but Mark, yeah, go off because like that, that was why I was glad you picked this one because I I know your background slightly. So if you want to rattle off a bunch of... Oh, well, maybe I should just quickly say that I lived in Japan for two years, you know, teaching English over there and then met my wife uh, back here in Michigan. And she's from Japan. 
And so it's really 25 years now that we've been together and so many trips to Japan and, and marrying into a Japanese family. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm able to bring to this conversation, hopefully, in, in terms of um, seeing some of the Japanese elements. Like, for example, uh, the scene where they where the father is in the bathtub with his daughters, I do sort of wonder if Americans might be like, oh, what's going on here? This seems so weird, you know, whereas in Japanese culture, that's absolutely age old tradition. And, you know, if anything, just beautiful family time, you know. Yeah, 100. Honestly, I didn't remember it at all. And I think as a kid, it must not have fazed me in the least because you would just not know. Like, I just literally doesn't mean anything. But I, I made a joke to Neil about it when it came on just because I knew he'd never seen it before. But then we had an interesting conversation about how actually culturally, even in the West, like a lot of families do that, like kids, like siblings will like bathe together and stuff. And I was like, maybe like this, this might seem a little like strange at first glance, but actually thinking about it, this isn't even that uncommon here to a certain degree. Sure. So I, that did make me wonder though, because yeah, like when it came up, I was like, what? I don't remember that. And like, yeah, I, I immediately figured, you know, this is probably a cultural thing. And it just looks a little jarring to us because we're not used to seeing stuff like that, um, especially depicted in media. But it's kind of funny because I, I don't feel like it's that weird. Like, I, I don't know if people would take the time to think about it. But if they did, it's not that strange. Right. How about the sequence where uh, Satsuki, the older uh, sister, goes into the house, but she goes, she's like using her hands and her knees in a kind of almost crab-like way as she's moving across the tatami interior of the house. Uh, did, does that seem weird or does that make sense to you why she's doing that? Yeah, no, I do not know. No, yeah, what do, do you got? What do you got for us on that one? Well, it's uh, usually you take your... Um, slippers off you know you take your shoes off before mm. you go into the house and the whole thing is about never tracking in the dirt of the outside world into the interior of the house right yeah and so we we all know about this removing of shoes but and i'm trying to remember the details of that scene but i wonder if she was in a position where she was maybe barefoot or something and there was no possibility of removing shoes but she couldn't track the dirt in and so she came up with this or maybe it's even a childhood tradition of like, well, as long as you don't let your feet touch, <laughs> you're all right to sort of go in there. You know, it's a really interesting moment. And it certainly, I think, relates directly to that Japanese tradition of, of not wearing your shoes inside the house. I think that's a, a great example of something that makes these films um interesting on another level. If you are just, you know, an American coming into this with no perspective outside of the American stories you've watched, like little details like that of like the body language of characters or the intimacy of a family or just straight up the lack of antagonism. Like there's no arguing. Like when you look at like kind of a modern, like family cartoon, there's usually so many dynamics of like, we're fighting, we're not fighting, we're mad. Somebody's a hero, somebody's <laughs> not a hero. Like this, there's so much harmony in this story. I think yeah. it, it's baffling. But right. you don't know why exactly when you're well, a kid. Well, I mean, the father is, and the father and mother are presented in such a positive light yeah. that it is startling almost. You're so used to, oh, there's got to be conflict within the family or, or one of the two parents is a problem or whatever. But, I mean, this father is almost like the nicest guy you've ever seen in yeah, an animated I, film. I would dare <laughs> say he might be like one of the all-time cinema fathers mm, in yeah. history. Like. He's just the perfect dad. <laughs> he's got a cool job. He's like an architect in the city. And he's like, you just handling him. Super cute. Super sweet. Yeah. Full head of hair. <laughs> Lush hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I got something on that uh, character that my wife told me that I didn't realize. And I always loved the voice acting for that particular character because I thought we sound so naturalistic. And I just feel connected to that guy. And she said, he's the one guy who isn't a professional voice actor. Uh -huh. I don't I don't know what he actually does. Wait, could but, you point out which version you're... Um, oh, you're I'm sorry. To? I'm talking about the Japanese. The, the original, we have to clarify okay. this. If you've watched it, <laughs> right. 
in Japanese with subtitles, you're going to hear this guy's voice. If you've watched dubbed into English, you'll, you'd never hear the voice. And, and I got to say, and I'm going to sound like a snob, but I've never seen the English dubbed version. I don't even know what that experience is like. It's I've only seen the it's Japanese not great. version. You're missing some pretty good Dakota fanning. Well, so it's I hear. interesting because yeah. the the version I grew up watching wasn't English because I was a little baby child. Um, but was it they the two thousand five Disney? No, dub, the original. No, yeah. The so what, there was this like Streamline, I think, studios or something like I that think made the its Fox own release from like eight ninety two. Yeah, or like three. the original mm -hmm. dub. Um, and I I don't even know what it sounds like now, and you can't find it anywhere anymore. Mm -hmm. But the Disney one is somewhat shrill. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and in a way, we've maybe watched two different movies in that sense because it's such a, a big part of it, isn't the voice? But if you ever get a chance to watch the Japanese version, you may notice that the the father uh, has, even if you whether you understand Japanese or not, he has a very naturalistic way of talking, and I think it's because he's not a professional voice actor. And uh, even for some Japanese, apparently that becomes a problem, and they're sort of like, oh, I don't know, that guy doesn't sound quite right. Oh, it's not so what I'm used to, but uh, I always liked uh, the, the sound of his voice. And I'll tell you one thing related to the father, and I wonder if you guys would agree with my little theory here, hmm. that at the very, very beginning, when they're in the truck heading in to, you know, get to the to the house, the very first line is when uh, Satsuki offers a caramel to the father. Mm-hmm. And I always wondered, is that maybe a symbol of Miyazaki saying to the audience, here you go, this movie is me. Aww. Oh, I love that. Uh, that, that offering rules. a caramel to you. Because the, there is something interesting about that being the very first line of the movie. Right. It's it's funny. I was thinking about what that meant, too, because I know the uh, the symbolism and there's so much richness to this film, like visually yeah. and metaphorically and whatnot. That That's the one I'm like, there's got to be something. But I think it could be like you're saying, as simple as that, which is just like, I think, something that speaks to the mastery, like such so early. I, I know Miyazaki had, had like a career leading up to this, but it's crazy that this is such an early work. It seems so. Yeah. There's so much space. Like, I feel like when you're younger, not that he was not, he wasn't that young, but like, there's an urgency to like, say what you need to say early on. And I think like Nausicaa has so much to say. This one right. does too, but there's so much. Yeah. Um, it's just so graceful with it. That yeah. Like it's so assured. Words. It's mm -hmm. so, it's so masterful and it, 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 he knows what he's doing. You just feel like you're in the hands of a master. Uh, storyteller and he doesn't he's like no i don't have to come up with some big explosion scene to to hold your attention you know i'm i'm going to keep your attention with a, with a boy lending an umbrella to these two <laughs> girls that are caught in the rain you know and it's that i mean that character kanta the the little boy that character is so memorable and so he funny. has almost no lines, but you know exactly what's going on in his head and how he feels about Satsuki and all of this stuff. He's very expressive. I feel like we get him back throughout. Like, he's kind of the boy. Who's the boy in Kiki? Do, do, do you remember? Oh, Tombo. Uh, is it uh, he's Tom, got, Tombo or something? Yeah, Tombo. He has a little similar hat, right? He's got, like, the little <laughs> sailor cap. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, a lot of Miyazaki, I would not say that they are the same because they no, are no. very distinct, but he has sort of these character types that show up a lot. Yeah. Um, or types of interactions where it's like a boy and a girl, like having a friendship, like it's kind of a, I don't know if you could describe this as a friendship exactly, but kind of. Yeah, it's kind of like, do I, am I, like he seems to be like the way he gets so stressed out when he try like he wants to do something for her but he doesn't know why and he like loses it yeah they're just like a little awkward like yeah awkward he's like kids. kind of in love slightly i guess um it you know it's, what it's I just never, enough but i never noticed until today the fact of the umbrella that he lends them an umbrella and then later on she lends totoro an umbrella and i thought oh my goodness there's this whole thing you know, element of the story that I've seen over and over without it really registering. But that mm. can't be a coincidence that, that he set that up, you know, one leading to the next. Yeah, this kind of like characters learning from each other or like passing something forward, like the acorns are kind of a, a symbol of that. Like they they appear, they're gifted, then they grow like, you know, I, yeah. I think it's just sort of these like little moral lessons, I guess, that are planted. So something, you know, like when we're talking about how 
masterfully this is, this narrative is constructed. There something I hadn't really realized until I was reading about it. Like this this story is like pretty intimate for Miyazaki. So his mother had spinal tuberculosis for several years and she was spending a lot of time at the hospital. Didn't know that at all. Yeah. And I, I think there were even little debates in terms of like slowly crafting this story where um, this is maybe uh, me speculating, but the choice to make it a one girl character and then split that girl character in two for the sake of uh, the storytelling yeah. and to not make it a boy and not bring it like too close to yeah. To home, you know, I, I I feel like that kind of resonates in in the crafting of this tale. Yeah, absolutely, and and I I mean uh, I didn't know that to be honest until today when I started to sort of look into it the the connection between this movie and Miyazaki's personal life. But surely he brought a lot of personal memories to that and 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 feeling about you know, and that's one of the powerful things about this movie is that. You know, the mother is in the hospital and she's uh, suffering from an illness, but they don't play it up too much, do they? I mean, they, we have a, a yeah. scene there where she's sort of combing her hair and and stuff like that. And But it, it, it only hits you later on, you know, when, when you see Satsuki break down into tears and you're like, oh, my God, yeah, she's really scared that this could be a terminal illness, you know. And that's when, you know, when we talk about, oh, this movie has no conflict or it has no plot. It's like, no, this movie has the <laughs> conflict. Right, that, it's life and death. <laughs> yeah, that is much, much more real than these than most of the movies we're used to, you know. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, that, that whole aspect of it, no wonder it, it came from his own life because he knew what that felt like. Yeah. And I'd like maybe to to get into a little bit of the character design because I've always been as some like I feel like so barely any of my art style is touched by the world of a Ghibli other than like cute car characters like in creatures like maybe I use that a little bit in my work but like you know Mark I used to read your books growing up and I could really feel the influence of this aesthetic on your work there was a gentleness characters had you know. You have characters with young faces. And I, I was always kind of, I don't know if it's distracting or not, but like the way the parents' features are very childlike. Like an adult face, the features continue to grow, right, as you get older. Right. And it's just kind of interesting the way the mom and dad still like retain like a, a cute little nose. Yeah, like you're young. <laughs> you're yeah. a young couple. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's very cute. Perfect yeah, dad. <laughs> no, I think you're right. Well, that is actually one of the defining characteristics of uh, manga and anime style, I think, is that sort of childlike face. And so the teenage characters have a face that looks like a much younger child's face proportionally, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I hadn't thought about it until you mentioned it, but yes, the father and mother character their faces probably look more like a teenage face than like a middle-aged face. Uh, and it's only when you get to the character of the grandmother where the, he just goes full on <laughs> wrinkly, you know, aged, withered face, you know, uh, it, and it makes it even a sharper contrast, doesn't it, to, to see this supposedly middle-aged character who kind of looks like he's in college or something. Uh, right. Yeah, he looks most. like he's 25. Yeah, which I... Give or take. <laughs> I guess he could be. I mean, he could be a young dad. <laughs> it's it's just a type you don't see. Like, the, the representation of masculinity is, like, so different. And especially when you grow up, like, reading superhero comics, like, you have yeah. these types that are, are so broad in a very specific way. It it I remember it being just kind of jarring to watch this stuff. I'm like is this a man I'm supposed to aspire to be? I don't know. I, I really relate to him, but how come he doesn't have a strong jawline? What do I do? Like, it's, a, it's a real emotional journey. Well, you mentioned mind. about character design and, and having seen my uh, books from years ago and certainly, um, you know, the Miyazaki films and Japanese uh, anime styles in general had an influence on my work right from the beginning. And, you know, I had this series called Akiko yeah. that had a character called Poog that definitely is inspired, at least in part, by these sort of Totoro-type characters uh, uh, from the Miyazaki world. And, and throughout my career, I've returned to that that type of uh, design style for these magical, 
uh, characters. There's something about the Japanese style that is um, just perfect for, for conveying that feeling that I want those characters to convey. Right. So, Caitlin, if you were to Google Poog, you would find almost a guitar pick rounded <laughs> shape with like big, beautiful, like kind of soft, shiny eyes and a cute little smile. Oh, my God. He is cute. <laughs> He's very... um. It, it's kind of in the category of the the soot spirits, what the yeah. susu watari, I guess is how how you might say it. How I, I might say it, I trust you. Possibly judgment. wrong. <laughs> well, it's funny because in the in the movie, if you ever get to see the original mm. Japanese movie with the Japanese voice, which I did watch it in the original. Oh, Japanese. did you? Just well, for the record. it is a completely <laughs> different start. thing. In in Japanese, they say makuro kurosuke. And the uh, kuro is the word for black, and makuro means jet black. Mm. And the suke at the end, I think, is to me always sounds like a, a from like a boy's name. But anyway, it's it's a completely different word, and I think they were stuck with translating it in, into English, and they came up with this word soot sprites or something like that, maybe. Yeah. Uh, to describe it, I think. I wonder where that came from, if, if Miyazaki just invented it or if there was indeed a tradition of of these magical soot creatures. But, yeah, that that's the perfect thing at, at the beginning of the movie, at the first introduction of a slight hint of magic, you know. And uh, we haven't talked about this idea that May, little May is able to see the magic stuff first and, you know, there's this is an old tradition, right, where the grown-ups can't see the magic thing. Only the kids can, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And so the older sister, Satsuki, you sort of wonder, is she, has she already grown too old or is she still young enough to still see it? You know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, from what I gathered is that um, the soot creature is just, it's like basically a yokai, I guess, like a, you oh. know. But not a, not one from history, just like Miyazaki's own version. Because okay. we, we see him in, um, what other movie did they pop up in? They're in like Spirited Away. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. I remember yeah. noticing that and thinking, oh, he brought them back. And I, I get the cat bus is also that. It's yeah. like a type of uh, yokai that's cat shapeshiftery, I guess. It's not literally like a cat bus, but that was, I guess that's what he was riffing on. Yeah. When he, there's like lore. I don't that. remember what the spirit is called, but the idea is like cats, when they, if they Buck continue to age, they can start to shape shift, which is pretty sweet for a cat. I believe now, you know, while we're talking about the cat bus, before we forget, we got to uh, tip a hat to the um, composer of the soundtrack. Oh my God. I think his name One is Joe Hisaishi uh, because that the cat bus theme and the, of course, the main Totoro title theme. Mm -hmm. And then there's, is it, uh, I can't think, it's something of the wind, the translation of it, but there's this magical uh, sort of soot sprite theme that I think that plays early on, that it's just such a gorgeous piece of music. And I do think that sometimes with movies, we forget how important the music is. And boy, that he just supplied... Uh, such great music to this movie. And I think it's a big part of why we all fall in love with it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, there's very specific themes that come up multiple times throughout the movie. And it's just so good. I listen to the soundtrack all day today. <laughs> I know. I do too. too. I, I, I go through phases of like, I'll get sick of it. Then I'll put on a piano version of it. Like <laughs> yeah. some covers. Just crank it. And like, <laughs> frankly, Joe Hisaishi like, has done a lot of Miyazaki's movies mm -hmm. and Ghibli movies. And they're just phenomenal. Like, yeah. The Princess Mononoke, so I'm trying not to bring up Princess Mononoke because I just keep wanting to draw comparisons between this movie and that. Like, it's so wild to me that they came from the same person, mm. but also it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But not to get onto that. But, like, he's just, he's, like, the perfect composer for these. Like, I just, they, I think the movies would feel very different with a different mm -hmm. composer. Yeah. Right. This is a great example of how much work the music does for, like, your imagination and your connect emotional connection to... To the visual elements. Well, and it's amazing. Like, there's this, like, it's almost cheesy, I would say, but this very cute, like, marching band type song at the beginning and the end. Right. Hey, let's go song with, like, um, it has lyrics. They do translate it for the English one, but in Japanese and, like, on the soundtrack, it's the Japanese song. Uh, and it's just adorable and, like, very peppy. And it has these, <laughs> the cutest visuals I've ever seen in my life. 
for this opening sequence that's very stylized and they have all these little like critters at the bottom and at the top and I'm just like this is phenomenal it's so good but then later like the soot spray theme is really mysterious and magical and it's I just think it's so cool that there's like really fun almost poppy stuff in this but then there's also stuff that's like Life is a mystery. Like, the, the contemplate the mystery of the woods with us right now in, like, a very serious way. Yeah. It just has everything. There, there, so that, I think that's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to build off that because I think that feeling we get of, like, the really cute and the, the, the mysterious of all these films and this style of storytelling. Um, I have some, like, books on Japanese architecture. When I was re-watching this quickly, just so Maura could, my wife Maura could watch some of it with me, I'm like, remember this movie? Like, when was the last time you watched this? Um, and when the soot uh, creatures came on, I was like, oh, I have this book. Uh, it's called In Praise of Shadows. It's, it's a really short essay, but it's like about a 30 or 40 pages long by Junichiro Tinzaki. I believe. <laughs> anyway, it's called In Praise of Shadows. And it's basically uh, uh, a, a little essay by an architect who talks about how Japanese buildings are designed to retain darkness in them in the way like the, the sloping roofs kind of arch over the walls and withhold the shadows and keep things in darkness as a, as a preservation, be, simply because that's when things look best. So it's like an aesthetic choice, like things look best by candlelight or in deep shadows or when windows are um, covered in like naturalistic paper instead of glass, like all these choices like Japanese yeah. architects make, they're all to preserve the darkness. And that scene where the kids are just going through what's kind of a haunted house at that point, basically. Right. right. Um, and then they encounter these like jet black creatures that kind of embody in a way, this idea of the shadow, like come to life because they, they phase in and out of like the darkness. And it is scary in a way. Like if you're really young, I think you could get scared in some of those early scenes because the house is empty and kind of quiet. Yeah. But uh, to me, it's kind of like speaking to that idea that darkness is, it doesn't mean the same thing as it does to us when portrayed in a story. It, it has like, a, it's important for something different than hiding like ghosts or something. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, th I think they go out of their way almost to make that house a mixture of sort of magical stuff and slightly dark or, like you said, haunted house. They even use the word haunted house. I think Kanta does, at yeah, least Kanta in the Japanese version. He won't go in. He won't yeah, go inside. Oh, right. <laughs> that this is like the local haunted house, you know. And we should say, speaking of architecture, that the choice of the architecture design of that house is unusual because it has Japanese elements, but it also has Western elements. And mm. that's, I'd love to know more about that, but I think they, they certainly made some choices there to create a one of a kind, uh, interesting, um, house in terms of the architecture. One thing, you know, speaking of like danger being right there at the beginning, one of the sequences that has always struck me and, and frankly has been a little puzzling to me is when the girls, you know, Satsuki comes to like this veranda area where there's this wooden beam and mm. she starts pushing against it. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. It? And it's incredibly loose. And yep. the, they go out of their way to show a big, heavy piece of chunk <laughs> of wood come crashing down next to her. And I'm like, any parent watching this is like, no, watch out. You're going to get yeah. yourself killed. Where's the perfect dad? Where is he? Yeah. Why is he not <laughs> snatching them out of the way? Uh, it's, it is such an interesting scene. And I, you know, for the life of me, I can't quite figure out. But maybe it's like you're saying that they want this to be a mix of dangerous stuff and happy stuff. And we're sort of, you know, we're mixing these two things together. When, Kaylin, when I see that scene, I think that that's kind of like our friendship. It's like <laughs> just absolute <laughs> chaos. It's like, is this let's just throw it down. This? Like, Just having a great time, maybe destroying our minds in a way as we like overanalyze the yeah, movie. That's a load bearing beam. Well, and I'll, I'll pause it that I think because watching that, I was like, you're an idiot. Like, get out of there, kid. But as a child, I don't think it fazed me at all. And I think it's like, this is what kids do. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's actually an unvarnished look at what a, a child. Yeah, I did absolutely. some really knuckleheaded stuff when I was a little baby. Um, I mean, I still do it now, but it's different. 
<laughs> and like that I think it is all that like a lot of what you see is the kids poking around and just mm-hmm. exploring things and I think that's part of it because you don't know you don't know enough about life yet to realize that this could actually kill you it right. takes you a while to learn that in the world because like later there's a scene totally not dangerous where may finds all the tadpoles and she just sticks mm-hmm. her hand right in there and is like tadpoles like awesome and yeah they're not gonna attack her but like if that was a puddle full of piranhas she probably would have done the same right. thing it's yeah. like, kids yeah. don't know we don't know stuff right yeah. we speaking for all children <laughs> No, I think that's true. True. It's about like first experiences, right? Like Yeah, like being innocent. Cuz like, all we know uh from what we know is like they're coming from the city, so it's kind of like the city mouse in the country and maybe it's her first time jamming her hand in a little stream. You might say honestly that like the same instinct that gets you to rattle a very rickety load-bearing beam is the same one that would let you see these magical creatures. Yeah. Like you don't know enough yet to be Bother, like really bothered by anything yeah or yeah. critical about what you're seeing it's just like a complete blank slate Well, we could get into the Totoros themselves is because there's some theory, I, you know, these are kind of trolly YouTube theories, but maybe rooted in something that like the King Totoro, the big guy with all the most chevrons on his chest. He's <laughs> General Totoro. <laughs> he's um, like, oh, it's he's like a demon spirit, like in his essence. But we're not seeing him that way. But if if evoked, he'll, you know, destroy, a, eat a planet or a destroy universe or something. Like, I, I think there's a, the idea that these Totoros are something special for these kids right now. But like maybe to adults, they're, they're spirits that maybe represent other ideas. But these kids are encountering them in such a naive way that they're they're projecting their own personalities onto them, I guess. Well, speaking of Internet theories, uh, I uh, heard someone saying that there had been a theory that uh, May, the younger sister, right from the beginning of the movie is supposedly dead. What? That, no. and getting into all this dark stuff. And then Djibouti, yeah. you know, the official people had to come out and make a statement and say, no, that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from wow. my beautiful movie with these horrible <laughs> like the most wholesome theories. movie yeah. <laughs> possibly ever. <laughs> Like there's so many, ver- you know, we kind of get into that with with all these films that kind of reach this iconic status. It's it's not like people want to tear them down, but they want a place in it that's new. It's like, oh yeah, we all love it, but what if it's about evil actually or yeah. something? Yeah, you know? and I think people just love to find stuff and stuff yeah. that exists, whether it's true or not. Right. Uh, and this, I don't have a theory. I just I'm gonna just bring it up like I did before because of the Princess Mononoke <laughs> thing. But with the demon spirit, I just like I'm very struck. I'm gonna have to watch Princess Mononoke again. I've seen it a million times. It's probably my favorite Ghibli movie. Uh, but just to compare and contrast with this a little bit because they they so much share the same themes in my mind of like appreciating nature, yeah, and sort of like harmonious living and like simple living and to some extent like family um or community Mm -hmm. and but there are i don't know if i would say that they're sort of vengeful there are some vengeful spirits in princess mononoke but they're all you know these giant animals i'm just just speaking to the audience as if you've seen it surely you have i don't know maybe watch it if you haven't it's really good but it's uh much more adult than this film just fyi uh but you know, like the the spirit of the forest in that one is this chaotic sort of god, like unknowable dear god creature, uh, and he's very mysterious. Uh, and in this one, it's like Totoro's the same, but he's way more like I'm here to have a good time. Yeah. And in Mononoke, it's basically like I feel like Princess Mononoke is the adult version of this movie, where things are a lot more actually dangerous and scary. It's not cute childhood stuff, uh, and people die. <laughs> Uh, and things are really just I, I feel like this movie was that story 
from a more me- like optimistic Miyazaki, maybe? I don't know. I'd, cause yeah. I'd love to know more about what happened between this movie yeah. and making Princess Mononoke, because Princess Mononoke to me is like a, a backlash like, to all of this, like, you know, mistreatment of natural resources in the natural world. And this one is just so much like, isn't this great? Like, there's so much to appreciate about this. Totoro is this just like cute forest spirit with a leaf on his head who is just like here to have a good time in a way, in a very wholesome way. Yeah. Well, I, it clearly um, uh, Miyazaki was interested in environmental themes right from the start. And I think this movie does it in a very light handed way, this sort of touching on a, a sort of worshipfulness toward nature, you know, mm-hmm. and the whole movie is an escape from the city and the factories and you know capitalism and all of that stuff and you sort of feel like he was sort he was starting to get into that message i feel like by the time of mononoke he was like okay i need to make these points in a bolder way you know and i think that one really did get into environmental themes i don't know how much we want to talk about other movies besides this one but i feel like certainly uh, in later films, you could see a, a Miyazaki who was becoming himself more troubled by the world around him and and being making these movies that were a little more angular or, or shocking or had grotesque elements in them that that um, are nowhere to be seen <laughs> in, a, in this movie. Totoro, thank goodness, because <laughs> I, for one, enjoy the, the gentleness of, of this film. But yeah, for sure, I think he he took on increasingly increasingly heavy stuff as he went along. Well, if we go back, I was thinking the same thing, but then I remembered Nausicaa is before this. That's and right, yeah. So, like, I, I wonder if it's a bit of um, the fact that Takahata was doing Grave of the Fireflies and it's like, well, maybe I'll I'll do the it's time for me to tell this story. So we kind of like balance the room a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. Well, Naushka, Naushka definitely <laughs> has stories. Has big environmental f- themes. That one you just reminded me of. That one really seems to to get into it. So yeah. And it's not sure. optimistic either. No. I, it sort of is by the end of it, but the story itself is quite harsh in yeah. a lot of points. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like the the t- I, I don't know. It's like so many of of the great directors have these sort of like little magical movies like this. Like I, like to me, I think My Neighbor Totoro will always be my favorite, even though Princess Mononoke like speaks to me as like a thing that I would love to have made. And like Nausicaa, I think that's such a grand project. Like reading the the graphic novel version it's watching it adapted it's such like an amazing tale of like a creative vision but for me totoro like i feel like i could never do something like this like warm and optimistic and perfect because i'm too like caught up in feeling like i'm trying to do something smarter or whatever like i think that's why this movie is so important to me it's like such an example of like someone really giving the right, like they're like giving a gift to the universe and it's like not exactly what they feel in a way, but it's like comes from their experience and they want to put something good into the world. And this movie is like just the essence of a good thing. It just seems like that's so hard to sit down and actually make from start to finish, like just a good thing. (laughs) Well, I think it takes guts to make a movie as yeah, quiet, as quiet as this. And, yeah. and when people say that it lacks plot, that might not be accurate. But I think you can say it lacks a traditional climactic sequence. And I'll mm-hmm. go along with that. It doesn't build towards a climactic sequence. And in a way, isn't that fantastic, you know, to watch a movie that frees itself from that requirement? Because movies over the last 10 or 20 years, it, the climactic sequence has become exhausting. Uh, yes. And uh, I'm so glad that this movie doesn't have. But, you know, the terrible fear of a young child going missing, that's that's all you need, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of stakes, right? So we don't need the climactic sequence. One thing that I'm always struck by is that when Satsuki is running around looking for her, 
they really take care to show the passing of time, don't they? Because yeah. the sun is starting to go down, and they just, bit by bit, every sequence, you see the sun going down little by little by little, and they, they really want you aware of that sort of ticking clock. It's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, totally. You see, like, the shadows start to stretch and, like, the landscape um, just sort of, like, take on different shapes and forms in the light. Uh, yeah, I feel like the closest, like, the there's kind of the joyous climax is that last cat bus ride as she, like, yeah. goes to get her sister, right? Is it, like, that we're on the, the phone best. line. What's that? It's the best. It is the best. It's so good. All right, can we talk about the cat bus a little bit? Yeah, yes. Now, the arrival of the cat bus is maybe the most perfect scene in film. That first <laughs> arrival. We all yeah. agree. <laughs> you know why I, I think I, I do that is, for me, the truth. Um, for me, for me. But um, it also, just thinking about it, it evokes, uh, I, was, I had to look up the guy's name because I couldn't remember, but the the illustrator, author of like the Polar Express and Jumanji, ah, Chris, Chris Van, Van Alsberg. Yeah. Th- those books where it's like kids and suddenly something giant and familiar but otherworldly appears out of nowhere and ruins the context of the reality you know, know. Like the Polar Express coming up through your house or like the rhino coming through the bookcase. It's like the cat bus coming out of the dark and just pulling up from like stage left, I think, right through. It's <laughs> Somewhere. Just, yeah. It's, um, it just has that perfect... Yeah. I guess kind of 80s or 70s, 80s kids book feeling like I feel like there were so many stories that did a thing like that. Well, I would almost say I'm having an epiphany right here right now. Do and it. it could be wrong. I don't know. I'm not an expert. But I wonder if like that's like the magical kid story move. Because mm. like for my generation, it was like Harry Potter. And the, the thing about oh, Harry yeah. Potter that was the hook, I feel like that oh, I don't think anybody really cares to talk about it now. But like. You, you just get a random letter at age 11 that you're like a magic person. Mm-hmm. And like, as a kid, you're like, yes, awesome. Like, that is so cool. And that's right. what this is. Like, like how I mentioned earlier when I was talking about watching this as a kid, like, this is what I wanted so bad. I was like, I hope the cat bus just shows up. Yeah. Every kid wants that. I think that's what makes this scene so awesome. And like, something huge and cute and cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and very mysterious to show up and then almost even better to leave after leaving you being like, what just happened? Like, what's that about? Yeah. That, it's just like the ultimate, no, nothing more magical can possibly happen to a child. No. Well, I love that it's a combination of this fantasy creature of the gigantic cat, but then it also still has the trappings of this sort of mundane bus stuff. Like the, right. <laughs> the the destination sign that has to change sort of manually on the top, you know that's it's yeah. so great that you've got the right the the incredible dream like thing and then crashing down with a thud to reality. All, some of these trappings of earthly <laughs> mundane stuff, you know, I think that, that's what really strikes me about that one. I had forgotten that the uh, the headlights and like the rear the tail lights are rats, yeah, you know, like mice, little red. That's rats. the moment where I was like, oh, this movie like really reaches out into the core of me. Um, oh, when sp- he- <laughs> Mark, I don't know if you know this, Mark, but I'm a rat enthusiast. Kayla loves rats <laughs> in my personal and, and professional life. Yeah. Okay, well, I can't let this pass by then without mentioning the big question that I had to ask my wife today because hmm. I was listening to a podcast where they talked about Totoro and they got to this line and we're sort of rewinding back to the beginning, but there's a part where they found the acorns in the house and the, the father says, well, maybe we got squirrels in this house somewhere. And I guess mm-hmm. in English they say, or else rats. And then oh. and then May says He said I'd rather have squirrels. I'd rather have squirrel. Yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to guess what they said in English. Because in Japanese they use the word nezumi, which I learned as meaning mouse. And so literally for the mm. last 25, 30 years, I have thought that that line was maybe there's a squirrel in the house, or maybe it's mice. And then she uh-huh. reacts and she says, Risu ga ii? And that means squirrel is better. <laughs> right? And I thought, oh, that's so cute. She prefers squirrels over mice. So there's a couple of different things to dig into. First, squirrels are quite unusual in Japan. 
I was uh, curious about that, if they even had them. They they barely have them at all. In fact, I remember Japanese, uh, like my uh, wife's nieces coming to visit us, and they were taking photos of the squirrels because they were so wow. charmed by the existence of squirrels. So that's one <laughs> thing. But then the other thing, and this really surprised me, is apparently in common everyday Japanese speech, they do not differentiate between a word for mouse and a word for rat. They're using the same word. Uh, so okay. it's perfectly fine for them to translate that into English as him having said rat. And boy, I said, we had a good long conversation, I can tell you, <laughs> earlier today, because I was like, they're so different in American culture, in Western culture in general. And you as a rat enthusiast can maybe speak to this, the the bad rap that rats so true. get, I've right? Talked the I've image talked about problem. This so much on the podcast, but yeah, <laughs> right, like I think unfairly, a never green topic here. It's like what makes squirrel, you know, what, squirrels and rats in your house, whatever. Maybe both bad. I don't know. Like, come on, <laughs> but yeah, people are definitely slam. But I, I loved that they were on the cat bus. Mm -hmm. I guess just like to me, yeah, okay, cats eat rats and mice, right? But we all, they all kind of live out there together, you know? Like, it means something. Oh, that's They're true. They're part of nature. And then in this instance, it's like, I'm the cat bus, and I got my little, my, like, mouse or rat buddies are, like, part of me. Right. Because when he, when the cat screams, they scream. Yeah, them. like, they're alive. <laughs> yeah. And I just... I, there's just something so magical. About I hadn't thought about this very much because like the classic thing is a cat that chases after mice mm -hmm. or chases after a rat. And here we've got a cat bus that he's like friends with the mice and the mice are helping him out. Right. Like co-workers even. Co-workers. Yeah. yeah. They both, both have municipal jobs, I suppose. And it's a fun, it's <laughs> like everything city. in this movie really is harmonious in that way. And like, what an interesting idea to even do that because mm -hmm. I didn't remember there being rats on it like lights in that way at all because he has his eyes are kind of headlights mm -hmm. right. and i thought that would be like i guess sufficient and my childhood brain i just erased the detail mm -hmm. so that was like a very deliberate detail for them to include that yeah and it's great and i loved it. the love and the love and effort that like often on the show caitlin and i like you know we we uh we pray for the the animators lost in the war that it is to like create these films and like all the effort and like so yeah. much carpal tunnel. Yeah, um, but like I feel like the cat bus was totally worth it. Like all those legs, somebody was like, "Please don't make me draw those." But when yeah. they when you see that design, you're like, "No, this is had to. God's work." Like design, draw that cat bus. He needs it's to not be a rendered. pair less. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because that that is certainly that number of legs must have been a nightmare to animate. And you mentioned earlier the scene where she reaches her hand into the tadpole mm -hmm. waters. That almost seems like an animator's flex in a way, right? Because the, the, <laughs> yeah. those tiny little, and they all go swimming smoothly off in different directions. I I was like, ooh, that took some time. Yeah, for, I also I read somewhere seconds. that it took a month to do the tadpole scene. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Wow. A human month. It stands out. I It's very clear in my mind. Yeah. It's just an unbelievable it. amount of time the, spent The way they're that. jet black, like there's no light effect on them. I feel like that really makes them um, kind of distinct. <laughs> well, and another way. thing, another thing to keep in mind, and I haven't really thought about this so much, but, you know, we're used to living in a, in a, uh, a post um, Disney Renaissance world, you know, that uh, started in the early nineties. Right. Mm -hmm. But this movie came out just before that. Yeah. So when this movie came out, you were still in the sort of doldrums of Disney feeling a little washed up as an animated company. I hope I'm right in saying that. Yeah, what are we yeah, in, like, I think Black Cauldron-ish? Yeah. Like, what? I think that's a little bit past then, but it's we were, like, right at the turn. Like, the good stuff was being made. But, yeah. yeah, it was, like, right on the tail of a very dark period for Disney. Yeah, so, I mean, how much more impressive must a movie like this have seemed to uh, any lucky Westerners who saw it when it first came out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you really have to hand it to Miyazaki kind of raising the bar just prior to uh, Disney finally getting its mojo back. So, something um, we also kind of dig into is try, trying to speculate on where all the money and effort went towards certain scenes. Because there's certain films that have like, whoa, 
all the money went right there. And then the last act kind of like feels, uh, you know, like it yeah. suffered because they spent too much. It's too top heavy or something. This yeah. one feels very well balanced. Like the, the cat bus journey at the end, it's so beautiful. It's like this great choreographed dance across the lands, all the lands and scenes we've seen already. Um, like there doesn't really feel like there's a weak spot in this movie that like maybe an early film from a, a lesser studio might. Um, cause I feel like when, when you make art, like you think about, you know, the exhaustion that comes with like the journey and, um, this movie just doesn't really have any of that. It just feels very well balanced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder, you know, we were talking about the, uh, animated things that must've been hard to animate. The scene when they go out in the middle of the night with Totoro and they've planted the acorns and they're kind of bowing and praying and then the acorns start growing at magically fast speed. That's another thing, a very smooth animation that yeah. to, to do it by hand must have been incredibly time consuming. So here's here's a, a question the internet has posed and I've stumbled across it. So that tree, I guess it's like a it's another camphor tree. A camphor tree, yeah. Right? Um, mm-hmm. Like the way it rises up, and I I never thought of this before. So this isn't really my idea. I'm just sort of like throwing it out there, and if it evoked anything in anyone at any point, um, that it kind of feels like a mushroom cloud and this idea that it's sort of the opposite of like a grave of the firefly story. It's like, this is a story where that iconography has been reversed and it's about this, this shape and form is about rebirth. And I'm like, that's kind of stupid, but there are one or two (laughs) little, there's a couple (laughs) shots. There's one shot where we're looking up at the house and the, the tree starts to canopy over and the leaves come around and the branches go up underneath it really kind of does look mushroom cloudy yes for just a minute like a brief moment when you brought this up initially i was like that's stupid also same reaction yeah i think you maybe have a point because it does look like it and also that's a very beautiful metaphor if true i have not found a trace of suggestion about this i don't know where you found it it was in the middle of a youtube video somebody sort of like pointed out only because of the double feature aspect though which I feel like is kind of weird, crappy internet theory to say that these two movies are really playing off each other in that way. I don't know if the creative but teams I, were. I do think it's interesting because this movie is but, set in the 50s. Yeah. It's so like it is like pretty immediately post-war yeah. situation. And it is sort of about recovery in mm-hmm. more ways than one. So I don't know that it's a huge focal point of the movie, but I I almost at this point would be surprised if that wasn't intentional yeah mark what do you think as someone who you know i know you didn't (laughs) you weren't there at this time but this is something i don't know that i think sticks with caitlin and i as we go down the rabbit hole of you know we talked about akira and like what that story means about you know japanese culture the future the past like where the culture was going at those times well you know i would want to hear it from miyazaki himself (laughs) before i make any assumptions but it certainly you know the 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 dropping of the bombs uh in, in Japan you know was a huge huge turning point in their history that um has spread on down the years you know uh, uh, with a sort of like national trauma almost that i think uh, understandably just lingers down through the generations. So when you mentioned that, I thought, yeah, that could be that. Could, yeah. So that could certainly be the case. I mean, like I think with the original uh, Godzilla movie that that was almost explicit, right? That it, Oh yeah, it, absolutely. It, oh, totally. They were, yeah. they were connecting these two things. So it doesn't sound too far fetched, but again, I would want to hear from the filmmakers themselves, but I know what you're talking about. When you look at that scene, the way it spreads out, it sure does have a little haunting uh, echo of that. Right. But it's it's like it's been transformed, right, yeah. in a way that like now this this shape and form is it's positive. Like it's being celebrated. It's like a, the community, they've raised it through a ceremony with these well, and cute I think new it's, friends. In a way, it's kind of telling that it's not there the next day. Yeah. But that true. the seeds have sprouted. Yeah. So it's that has gone away. But the now, remains of. Now, do you remember the English translation of what they say? Because we always used to love to say those lines that the, oh. the older sister and the younger sister have two different interpretations. 
And <laughs> the older sister keeps saying, even though it was just a dream, is what they're saying in Japanese. And then the the May, the younger sister is saying, it wasn't just a dream. And <laughs> they, they keep repeating, but they're saying the opposite thing. Even though it was just a dream, it wasn't just a dream, right? So they, they're <laughs> yeah, both interpreting the, the opposite of that. I don't know what, how they did that in English. Uh, but in Japanese, that's kind of what they're saying at that moment. And it always made us chuckle. It's really interesting that the decoding of the train, I mean, this is the case with so many like subtitled films, but because even the title, so like my neighbor Totoro, Totoro is a word Miyazaki made up. And yeah. I think if you, in the original version, the idea is May is saying a word wrong. Yeah, I think the pronunciation of the word troll in Japanese would be Todoru or Todoru maybe. So, Caitlin, uh, do you remember when watching those American dubs? It's not present. Like, they, it, that's not really part of the story that she's saying it wrong. They hear the word right or something. Uh, it's kind of lost, that general. I think, you know, honestly, speech. it just goes by so fast. I, I did not realize that that was the case until, like, the other day. Mm. And I read it, and I was like, that's why it's called Totoro, because I never looked it up. Right. Uh, but Neil actually noticed it when she first encounters him. May runs through this little tree tunnel, and she finds him sleeping mm -hmm. in his little, like, tree cave. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I think you're Totoro. And Neil was like, what? And I was like, what? Like, what? how do you know who he is? And uh, I think it's her sister, Satsuki, that says, oh, you think he's like the, the from your storybook? Yeah, yeah. And even right. then, to me, to even to my adult brain, I was like, I'm not quite putting this all together. It's true, right, yeah. But yeah, so it would be that she's reading the Three Billy Goats Gruff, like, fairy tale story. Mm. The Troll Under the Bridge is where she's learning it. And uh, in the credit scene of this movie where it kind of goes back to that hey let's go cute graphical style but we're getting these little interstitials of like them hanging out with their mom who's come home mm -hmm. yeah. there's a point where I, I believe it's her mom is reading them the book and it has a little white goat on the cover you can tell it's that book yeah so i just i don't know if it's like slipping by me during the movie but it's yeah it's straight up this like this fairy tale that we would all be familiar with right that she's yeah. getting this from and being like oh he's a troll which is also funny because the troll's a bad guy, I think. And she's right. like, this is great. I'm right. so happy yeah. to be here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know if you know that Tonari in Japanese means next door. Oh. So my neighbor, oh, Totoro, if, if you did a more literal translation, it would be Totoro next door. Oh, that's cute. That's uh, even cuter than I could that's imagine. That's really cute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that is interesting. And, and my wife and I both sort of puzzled over that moment in the story where the older sister said, oh, you're trying to say this other thing. And uh, indeed, it does seem to come from troll <laughs> uh, with her coming up with her own pronunciation. One thing, if I had to do one minor critique of the film, and I, I think there might have been just technical limitations or something, but when mm -hmm. she is in Totoro's home and she's talking to him, that voice of Totoro's, I don't know how they produced that voice, <laughs> but I always wish that it was a little uh, warmer or more organic ah. sounding or there's something a little like slowed down tape effect or something to that that ah, really? to me never seemed like it quite was worthy of this amazing creature. I actually kind of agree. Well, and, but hearing, I don't know. Is but this... are we hearing a different thing in the HBO, the oh, Disney version? Yeah, oh, I didn't a good watch question. the Disney version. They may have changed it. I don't know. So I, yeah, maybe, but I, I honestly doubt it. Not sure. But mm. in the Japanese version, I did notice that. And I. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, he. I like even as a kid, I feel like I felt that way. Mm. But I kind of wonder if it was just a thing. It's impossible to say. But was it a thing where, like, maybe no sound would be right, you know? Like, if Totoro mm. spoke to you in, like, human language, would it be like, that's, it's like Garfield talking. You're like, really? That's his voice? I don't know. Maybe. Like, it's hard for me to imagine what I would have done there, but I did notice that also. Yeah. It's just like, this well, feels like, maybe it's just that he's kind of scary in a way. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to look into this and see if the English dubbed version supplies a different sound there, because in that way we are starting to talk about two different movies, maybe. Like, I remember seeing a version of Kiki's Delivery Service that 
was translated into English. And that one I did watch start to finish. And it had uh, Phil Hartman doing the voice of uh, Gigi, the Mm -hmm. black cat. And again, I'm going to sound like a snob here, but it is appalling what they did. (laughs) They... They were introducing snappy little jokes where there was no dialogue at all. Uh, They were really inserting new writing into that story that had never been there and and stamping in a completely different personality onto the cat. And I just like, ugh, that maybe that's what turned me off of the English dubbed versions of these movies. But maybe that since then they've done a more thoughtful well, and I, if I'm remembering correctly, because I don't know if I actually saw that one. Um, I might have when I was younger. But if I'm remembering right, not to spin off into Kiki's discussion, we'll move on after this. <laughs> but, but kind of a fun, not fun fact about that is that um, because like Western people, whoever's making that dub, didn't like that Gigi stops talking at the end. They like added a line where he talks at the end, hmm. which kind of fundamentally changes in the actual movie. Gigi stops talking and he never talks again. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. And in that dub, they were like, but he does, though, <laughs> in this one. And it's like, okay, yeah. sure. I think there were maybe different stages of the West's attitude, per, per, you know, in particular Hollywood's attitude towards Miyazaki. Mm-hmm. And when they, when they did that one, they probably thought, oh, we're doing these people a favor to get this movie under the eyeballs of our huge audience. And, and they should be grateful that we've put the Disney name on it. And you know what? We'll lend them our expertise and this, <laughs> we'll make, we'll improve this movie a little here and there, you know, tuck a few things in here and there. It's going to be even better. You know, I feel like that was the attitude. And I would like to think since then that those attitudes have changed. The listening to, to you to talk about sort of like the choices made to create a completely fictional character and define it like through voice and sound and evoke like a friendliness, but also a scariness that added to like questions my wife was having about the movie when we were watching. She, she was like, oh, where's the mom? Oh, that's right. The mom's gone and all, all these things. And the kids are running amok and they discover these creatures in the woods, but you don't see them till later. I was like, oh, my God, this movie is like kind of an E.T., in a lot yeah. of ways, like it's it's we have a parent who's missing. It's kind of unspoken for a lot of it, but you can kind of feel yeah. the anxiety of the kid through the separation. We have like a magical otherworldly creature that doesn't come in till a little later. Kids running amok, kind of like misunderstanding words, like naturalistic dialogue. That's very like Spielbergian. Like it's not that it's exactly a one to one, but you can think that. E.T. was like such a big deal, like six years before. It's almost impossible that like making another like magical movie like this about young kids and like kind of a coming age wouldn't have a little bit of of that in it. I that's kind of like a stretch, but it's just something I was thinking about. I think there probably is some influence of of E.T. in a wide range of these other, um, you know, childhood classic movies in there. One thing that I think you have to say about Totoro, whether he intended to or not, I think Miyazaki created his big merchandising bonanza in this third movie or whenever it was. Yeah. And it's almost as if after that he decided, okay, I don't need to do that anymore. And I, I don't think that you see the movies that are nearly so merchandising friendly as this one was. Uh, but man, yeah, the Totoro dolls and cat buses and all that stuff. And it's just like, uh, he, he found the perfect design for stuff that could become the ET of Japan, you know, uh, and throughout East Asia, I think. Uh, yeah. And it, it's always been sort of interesting to me that since then, I feel like he's sort of reined himself in a little, you know, when you talk about Ponyo and things like that. I mean, Ponyo comes pretty close hmm. uh, to to this movie in its vibe, but uh, I don't think the design of those characters was really intended to uh, catch on in quite the same way that uh, the Totoro ones did. Yeah, I, I was thinking, like, the scene when... 
May discovers Totoro and she's like poking the tail and grabs it. I, it just makes me think of how I, I have a, a dog. Her name's Dottie. She's half chow. Whenever somebody sees her, she's she's a big, soft, puffy dog. They just want to do exactly what May does, which is like <laughs> grab it and shake it and squeeze it into oblivion. But you can't do that in reality. Dottie these probably are doesn't take that very well. <laughs> but it's like that that scene is such wish fulfillment and like, of course, translates perfectly into the cutest stuffed animal like one could imagine. And that's what you do. Like when you buy that stuffed animal, you live that scene. <laughs> I'm going to buy one myself, I think. I'm thinking yeah. about it right now. <laughs> well, I li- oh, I'm sorry. I was going to just no, say, no, I-, I listened to a podcast where one person found the cat bus really disturbing. And they all started talking about, you know, the idea of climbing inside this living creature as uh, bizarre and off-putting or whatever. And I was like, really? Because I think it's so delightful and magical. And as a kid, for sure, this idea of sitting on a a seat that is warm and fluffy and, and yeah. living and moving beneath you is just, there's, it seems just delightful. Yeah, I would no, say, no, I, almost, wrong, that person. I feel like <laughs> what, in any other movie, I could easily see feeling that way. Like, if sure, I kind think of about what it is, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, that is horrifying. Cronenberg. And the fact that Miyazaki made it so appealing yeah. is a triumph. Mm-hmm. You're like, this man, I, I don't throw this word around very much. He's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. You you did the thing. But like, truly, like the fact that his flesh widens to make a door and makes should a sci-fi gross you sound. out. Yeah. It just doesn't because yeah. it's so cute. And that well, is absurd. We haven't wonderful. talked about the, the build up to that scene, which I think is actually quite important of, of Totoro stepping up beside her. And then when she hands him the umbrella and then the drops of water and how he reacts to that. And then he sort of the deliberately causes thing. more drops of water. It's really masterful, you know, that he, mm-hmm. he's like, before the big cat bus thing comes, I'm going to give you a few quiet moments of uh, of beautiful interaction between these uh, two characters. But then there is the loudest moment ever where he like realizes that he can create droplets and then right. like sl- <laughs> shakes rattles the earth. <laughs> I love that though. Like I love that whole moment just because that yeah. really shows you what Totoro's about and like he's yeah. just loving life and he's never felt this. And I hadn't noticed this before until the last time I watched it, but his ear is tucked into the umbrella where he is like his ear is touching the umbrella and kind of poking through the top (laughs) and i was like he can probably feel the rain like even more and that's just like blowing his mind and just his huge smile and they're they're show me the person on earth who is like this sucks there's you don't exist there's no way everybody loves this it's the cutest (laughs) thing ever that's just it's like seeing a puppy figuring stuff out for the first time yeah yeah totally it's just too cute. And yeah. then you're like, this is the essence of goodness. Like, he is the spirit of pure goodness. I, it would be a huge sell to mm-hmm. get me to think, like, oh, he's like a demon of some kind. And this is just, like, his good side. No, yeah. like, it's not even worth thinking about. Yeah, it's almost like mean? he's a cute elemental. Yeah, right. And it, it this is a very 80s thing in the E.T. category. The fish out of water creature that's, like, discovering something. In yeah. E.T., it's more like, oh, there's a beer in the fridge or like, I can, <laughs> I, here's a dog. What's that do? But in this, it's like just, it's funny that he's interacting with the natural world, which he already exists in. But for some reason, oh, you know what? It's the addition of the umbrella, the human right. object that makes it um, special for him. Yeah, he's never experienced that before. Yeah. And now he'll have it forever. Well, he did have that. Where do you think he got that top from? Did he create that? That's a that? great question. I think so. <laughs> I think that might have been his own thing. That magic top he has at Maybe the Maybe people Mark? got tops is? from him. Mark, is that is the magic top kind of like a Japanese like? Oh that yeah, that, that that's or? a childhood toy. I should ask my wife about that if that has some uh, extra meaning to it. Um, but yeah, that is sort of like an ancient. I think it goes back to ancient uh, China, really, where you'd pull the rope uh, of mm-hmm. this giant wooden spinning top. Um, but yeah, I'd forgotten about that as, as sort of his element of or, or his method of rising into the air. It's funny how the um, I think kind of some of the magic of this and this seems to be intentional for a different reason. But Miyazaki said in this movie in the 50s, a time removed from modern tech, which is also like kind of why I guess the fathers sort of like left the city to try to 
you know, find a, a more nurturing space for his children and his own like state of mind. But all the artifacts of this era in the way that like it works when you set like a uh, make a modern movie, but set it in the eighties. Cause now you don't have to deal with cell phones. Like the, the fact that this movie has just s- simple objects available yeah. to its cast, um, just makes it a lot more pure and it, it makes the story like more profound. Well, somehow. I should say that there in Japanese culture, there is a real love of the, and a romantic romanticizing of the hometown by which is meant the small, uh, rural hometown that people grew up in before they moved into Tokyo and had to become a working stiff, you know. And so they'll go to the bar at night and sing uh, karaoke or karaoke, depending on how you want to pronounce that. <laughs> and, but they will sing the song about, oh, my hometown. In Japanese, it's furusato is the word for hometown. And there's such this sort of aching and longing for the hometown. Uh, and I think this movie for sure presents this absolutely idealized, gorgeous vision of the Japanese countryside. And uh, as you said, the 1950s, a simpler time. Uh, you don't even see them watching TV, do you? The, no. It's mm-hmm. all just the, you've gotten away from all that stuff. The karaoke made me think like a uh, kind of lost in translation, but with Totoro's and you kind of go on this like wild adventure singing karaoke. With, <laughs> in the camp. With a Totoro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One thing that we didn't mention, and uh, I think Ghibli movies will do this periodically, is they'll put actually quite important stuff in the credit sequence at the end of the movie. And we talked about it briefly, but um, I don't know if we mentioned that they show that the mother has had a third child. Uh, Wow, I've never noticed that. I think so, that there's a little baby, uh, and that just underscores her returning to health. And Mm -hmm. I heard somebody mentioning that, um, and this may be reading a little too much into it, but they thought that the age gap between... May and Satsuki may be suggestive of, of again, these sort of recurring health problems and different things. And, uh, so to, to have that little baby shown in the final credit sequence is actually quite a big, like, extra happiness on top of what was already a happy ending. Caitlin, you want to pitch a sequel or... <laughs> there is a sequel it's true there kind of is hard pivot there's a sequel and i haven't seen it and that makes me so upset uh mark have you had the pleasure of seeing the sequel to this film Thir- it's a 13 minute short it is Uh-oh. Uh, i'm not sure if it's uh currently screening or not but the only place that you can see it generally speaking is in the ghibli museum oh in really japan oh i've never yeah. heard of this um, I had not really, I was sort of vaguely aware that there were some exclusive animations at the Ghibli Museum, but I did, I stumbled across it today. And by stumbled across it, I just meant the existence because you cannot watch it online except for on YouTube, there is somebody who has clearly filmed it like from an <laughs> yeah. audience seat, like it's very yeah. poor and I just couldn't do it. So I didn't watch it there. Um, I think it's called May and the Kitten Bus. It sure is. And it's really? about... Baby cat bus. It's and like the child of the cat bus. Oh, yeah. no. You can see a few images. Basically, from what I understand, they just sort of go on an adventure together, mm-hmm. and that's the bulk of the film. So she's riding around the countryside in this, like, basically like a one-person, one-child-sized baby cat bus. Oh. Now, Caitlin, did you did you see any screenshots? Because I saw a couple from I've the I've seen some, yes, and some concept art. Did you see that there's, like, a cat train? I Yes. There's a cat boat. This is like, like, honestly, it really, it does really genuinely hurt because it sounds so cute. And apparently there's, there's basically uh, this whole sequence at the end of it. And I'm just repeating this blind from a synopsis um, where there's sort of like a a cat vehicle party where a bunch of different cat (laughs) vehicles, like you described, join together. And they're all full of like Totoro-esque creatures. (laughs) And I think I like, I don't know if I'd be able to handle it. Honestly, I just think my child heart would explode but 
if you google it you can find a poster of it and it's done in the style of the opening credits of this movie with may like marching across the screen and then there's the kitten bus picture just this tiny little thing and it might be the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Maybe the best sequel of all time, actually. So, yeah, if anyone's seen this, I'd love to hear from you. And also, how dare you? I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we get a chance to see it. They've done like, I guess they screened it at the Disney Animation Studios at some point, like the early 2000s. It's like oh, okay. sometimes you may have been lucky enough to see it at some kind of external thing. But for the most part, nope. <laughs> well, it's not a sequel, but I could say that for me, the... The Miyazaki film that most reminded me of the Totoro and Kiki era was the uh, Arietti, the secret uh, world. Is that the secret world of Arietti? Yes, I actually have not seen oh, that. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. Oh, you both, you got to see. If you like this movie, go see that movie because it's really good. And it's, okay. I mean, it's not quite at the level of Kiki or, or Totoro, but it's, it's pretty close. I mean, it's got some really great stuff in it. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, I will watch that. All right, well, that's all for now. Uh, Mark, where can the people find you? Well, I guess the easiest way if you want to interact with me is on Twitter, which would be twitter.com slash Mark Krillin. Just get the spelling of my name. Uh, and then uh, after that, YouTube, of course, is probably the place to, to really... Uh, see my videos and I'm still trying to upload a new one every two weeks um, and I'm on Instagram and there's uh, Facebook on Instagram it's Mark Curley Real on Facebook it's Mark Curley Official so uh, those are the main ones All right, and you can check out our episode archive and other facts about Caitlin and I at cartoonfeelings.com you can tweet at us or join us on Instagram and both of those can be found at Feeling Cartoons and if you're enjoying the podcast, we would be very grateful if you would take the time to rate us on Apple Podcasts, leave a review, and or share us with your friends. Uh, and we're still throwing this out there. If you leave a funny or cool review, we'll read it on the show. That's right. We love reading. I ch- Yeah, we're very into that. This is a reading podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is about books now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.